corn. It's not just for fields of dreams or ethanol in your fuel. It's for emergency runways on this episode of In the Hangar. And welcome to In the Hangar. I'm Dan Milliken, and this is Chewy, the co-pilot. <laughs> I'm Christy Wong, and I'm not super excited. Uh, oh, Christy, he's not going to bite you? He tried to nibble on me earlier. His name is Chewy. Okay, it was for Chewbacca from Star Wars, not for nibbling Chewing on, on my arm? No, it's not for that. So uh, hopefully Chewy will do good in this episode, and we won't have to... <laughs> and we won't have to do something about it. But uh, anyway, I, I like having Chewy around. But um, this episode is about corn. Yes, this episode is brought to you by our awesome sponsors, Colton Mortgage and Flying Eyes Optics, which somehow make you look cool. Oh, thank you. I think. <laughs> okay. All right. So in this episode, um, some some of you might have heard about a plane crash last summer, right before Air Venture, uh, in which a uh, Cessna 150, the flaps were at 40 on on final, and uh, the flaps wouldn't retract. And uh, when you have that, you know it can lead to trouble. But we're going to get into that story. The pilot is here with us today, Matt. Thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Enjoy. Hey, Matt. Super nice to meet you. Yeah, nice Thank you for you. joining us. All right, Matt, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and then how you became the owner of a Cessna 150. So I'm a typical 40-year-old man that uh, I drive for a living. I, uh, I own my own truck, but I don't own a company or nothing. So I basically lease it to them, what is today society's called owner-operators. And so the weekends is kind of my time if I can make it home for the weekend to play and do my hobbies. And my love is aviation. Nice. So I snuck in the back door on aviation. It's something I've always loved. And like most people, I didn't believe I was enough of a person financially, mentally, to get into aviation. Really? So um, the buddy that I fly around with, his name is Don Browett. He is a retired TWA captain. He's a veteran. He's a very ornery old man. And we fit together like two awkward puzzle pieces. Hmm. And uh, we have a, a very unique personality when we're together. And he's always been kind of my mentor, my role model. And I didn't think that I would ever be able to achieve that level. But one day flying with him, he told me, he said, someday you're going to have to take the controls. And what he meant was, I'm going to have to get my pilot's license. He won't be able to continue wow. to fly at some point. Of course, he's about 40 years older than me. And he made a very sensible point. So at that point, I borrowed the 150 that actually went into the corn to take my, to do all my training and everything. And it was an affordable aircraft. Um, Don was co-owners in it. There was another guy named Bill that was a co-owner in it. And Bill had gotten cancer and wasn't able to fly it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don's got a couple other planes that he used to fly. He doesn't much anymore. So they had no problem letting me borrow this 150. So I trained in it with um, a couple other pilots that were transitioning from basically to the STP level, and they were building hours. So this was perfect opportunity for them for cash. So I never went to a flight school. I did my ground school training through M0A mm -hmm. and passed really well. I was surprised how well I passed. But then again, I'd been around it a while, so I was surprising myself at this point. So uh, we got it all the way to the point of my check ride. I um, acquired a guy over in Kansas that said he would come help me out with it, and I was super nervous, mm -hmm. crazy, crazy nervous. I didn't have the confidence that probably most students did in schools. You know what's funny you say that, though? A lot of students go into aviation without that confidence, and it's not until passing that first check ride that they actually start gaining some confidence. Yeah. So I, what, you're, what you're describing, I've noticed in students – Along the way, as I've trained, they're very underconfident, and it's not until they get start getting through ratings that they they actually start building confidence. So what you felt was normal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can believe that. So I passed and got my thing, and at that point, the opportunity arose for me to buy a half share in the aircraft, so I would be partners then with Don Browett mm -hmm. in this aircraft. And Don, at that point, was retired. He didn't have much of a monthly income in his retirement. 
Um, he had lost most of his family. His children has both passed away. His wife has passed away, so he's by himself. So he's almost like a father figure in my life, even though I have a father. So at that point, mm -hmm. I became the pilot, but there's still opportunity for me to kind of get out and get away. I don't have a lot of time. I still don't have a lot of money, but now I'm a pilot with an aircraft, so I can right. go enjoy myself. So I've done some stuff like the Mayday Stoll competition. Mm -hmm. I got to fly there with my daughter. And when ACAs popped up, they said, you can come in for free. So I thought this is perfect opportunity. Yeah. So I went to the, the uh, um, ACA up in, what was it, Rock Falls, Illinois. I think it's a little bit of a flight for me in a 150, but it's still doable. So you're looking at a couple hours, and we was easily there. Nice. You know? And uh, I didn't really know Dan Greider. Mm -hmm. I had met him once before. Um, I offered to hand prop his aircraft. He didn't know me, so he wasn't comfortable with it. And um, so he kind of pushed me away. So that day at ACA, I was tired, had been there all day. I was ready to leave and do my thing. And uh, I went into the building where it was air conditioned because it was hot that day. And uh, they were doing the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, debriefer mm. for their stall competition. And there's a group in there, and you get to watch Hal Stockman and Corey Robin and Jason Boussard. These are amazing guys. I'm not a Bush pilot. I probably could not never be. Maybe I'm underestimating myself like I did before, but those are like my heroes. Mm -hmm. People get into the sports team. I get into those guys. Watching, you know, like Hal Stockman do crazy things with his airplane, to me, is right. just amazing. So I sat back like a spectator and watched. And uh, at that time, it was over and everybody left. Dan's left in the building, and I'm still waiting on the bus, you know. So uh, that gave us opportunity to speak, and he asked me where I was from, who I was, what I was doing, and I told him I had a 150. And I always brag that I have the cleanest 150 ever. If you've seen my 150, even the accident pictures, you'll see it's painted inside and out. It's, nice. it's a beautiful aircraft. We've taken a lot of care to really get it to that point to where it is really a plus in its field, even though it is kind of the Ford Escort of airplanes, <laughs> right. you know. I got my private in at 150. And I, I always feel that I get respect from people because a lot of people started out yeah, absolutely. in those little aircraft, you know. Nothing wrong with an, an aircraft if no. it flies. No, and it, it, it gets you airborne and it obviously gets you to some vents like Mayday and Akin and, and some other ones that we have fun visiting. So at that point, you know, I'm bragging how wonderful my airplane is and at this point I think he wants to see it so I offer to take him flying and everything seems like it's gonna go great right right so you guys go flying yeah and he says he wants to see his runway which I didn't see a problem with that and he throws 40 degree flaps in there's a huge opinion about 40 degrees flaps so you normally don't I can't say that. So going into that event, I was with my wife, and uh, um, you were supposed to radio before you landed. Well, we got up pretty high. It's not like you can kick the AC on in a 150, so you go high. Right, Even right, yeah. That takes you forever to get there, but the air's cool. you, you get up in to the where summer. the air's cool. So we're radioing in. I'm thinking, if they don't let me land here because I've overlooked something, then I might as well maintain my altitude. So I think we come down of like 8,000 feet or something, and I got clear down to around 3,500 feet, and I wasn't going to go no lower. So my thought is, is if I can't get them a hold of them on the radio, I don't get what I want, then I'll just go somewhere else. I've got plenty of fuel and plenty of time and altitude to do that. And, uh, but I get all the way there, and I finally did get a hold of them. They were using handhelds. Oh, so they couldn't a few So they miles. couldn't reach out. So they were hearing me just fine. I was not hearing them. And uh, I don't remember the pilot that was in right before me. Um, I think it was that fire pilot or something. Mm -hmm. I think he might have landed right in front of me. Because I heard him talking to him, and I thought, well, if he's hearing him, why ain't I? And uh, so finally got a hold of him. So this is the day before the incident. I got cleared to land, and there's the runway right there. Oh, so I threw in 40 degrees. And, boy, she comes down out of the sky like a rock, you know. She so really you, does you wonderful. Don't normally do 40. I wouldn't say normally, no. But there is times, and in that case, the day before, I threw in 40 degrees. Right. I brought it down to about 1,200 feet and then pulled it back to 20 degrees. For the landing. Which easily let me go back into a slow glide, you know, without having to dive the nose down real hard. And uh, then landed. It was all beautiful. So I've never had problems with the flaps. 
Matter of fact, until this happened and everybody comes out of the woodwork and says, oh, I've had problems with Cessna flaps, mm -hmm. you know? And you go, man, I wish I had known this before. <laughs> Look, see, you make fun of my warrior, but I've got the manual flaps. Yeah, but what would happen if that bar just comes off? Well, what would I, you do then? Then I don't get have any flaps, I well, guess. Well, what if you're already full flaps and you pull the bar? Then you slip it. Yeah, mm -hmm. there. Right. Yeah, we'll see in a warrior you could do that. No, you land it in the cornfield. That's what you do. <laughs> Which, oh, I'm, I'm about sorry. to learn. Oh, I'm about to. Spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> So me and Dan go flying that day, and he wants to see his runway, and we had already circled the airport once, and then we come in, and, and he looked at his little bitty, and it was tiny, little uh, makeshift runway that they had set up between a taxiway and, and another little area there, and he says, okay, we're good, and I've had a ton of people ask me, did it Dan intend to land there? I don't think so, but how do you read somebody else's mind? And hey, one, I don't know that you could have landed there. I don't know how these bush pilots are doing, but their planes are made for it. But it was tiny, you know? So he says, oh, we're gonna go around. And we were still up a little ways. We were probably 800, 1,000 feet somewhere. Oh, okay. I don't know, I, I wasn't focused on the altimeter at that but point. But you, uh, you were left seat and pilot flying. No, 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 no. So well, I guess I should back up. So when we took off, we had made it to the downwind after we had circled, right? And at downwind, he asked if he could take the controls. At that point, we did our typical thing. Of, but you're still left seat. I'm still left seat. Okay. I tell Dan at that point that uh, the plane is yours, and he said, my plane. So everything seems to be really smooth at this point, even though, like I said, we were basically just acquaintances. So I don't know how you should, if I had to do this over again, do you just allow acquaintances to take the controls of your aircraft? Well, reverse it. Um, did he allow an acquaintance to hand prop his plane? No, no, I didn't, you know. It's good to know, but, you know. Maybe in my case, I've seen him on YouTube for a All while. Right. So you, so it was and more than a conversation to before the hand. He's, he he uh, said he had a Cessna. He's had a couple of them that were 150s, and one in particular he said was exactly like mine, which I imagine is probably how his kids have trained. Right. Because like we said, it's a wonderful airplane for that. So on downwind, I say, uh, you can take the controls. He says, my controls. And that's when we turn crosswind, and then uh, we're in for final for his little tiny thing that these guys amazingly land on. You know, So we get down there. At that point, he says, OK, I'm good. And he went to 40. No, it was on approach to that. He, he starts bringing them down 20 and 40, which it happens so fast with an electrical. I mean, right. it's only a couple seconds there, right. and I'll admit, I'm still a young pilot. I'm out the window going, ooh, you know. <laughs> right, right. I'm a pilot, but we still get to do that, right? Right, absolutely. I do it. I, I still do it. <laughs> you know, somebody else is flying, and I feel like he's plenty confident enough, so I'm at a little kid out a window, you know, mm -hmm. and just enjoying myself. And, and, and at that point, he says, okay, we're good, and we're going to go around. Carburetor heat off, full power in, and away we go. And the next thing I know, you get the surprised look on Dan's face, which is something I don't think any of us has ever seen. And he <laughs> says, what is wrong with your airplane? Uh, Not my fault. <laughs> and then he says, your flaps, they won't come up. Are your flaps coming? He, nope, the flaps ain't coming up. So I said, all right, continue to fly it. And I said, let me try to figure it out, even though the flap switches between us. But all the circuit breakers are in front of me. Right, it's a good call. And then I've got some switches. So I'm going over this and checking all that. And in the meantime, there's houses in front of us. So he starts a very slow bank to come back around. And it was a closed runway. So if we could have made it a little further, we could have possibly made the closed runway. But you'd have had to make that full embankment, basically make a full 180 turn there. And, or B360. So uh, I let him continue to fly as I'm, at that point, almost getting violent with a switch. Right. So he tried cycling it. Oh my gosh, yes. I wanted to rip that switch and apart it comes at that off. point. <laughs> All these wires trailing. <laughs> you know, you don't really have a time to really think about a lot of things because, I mean, the rest of our flight was probably less than a minute after right. that. And it's a very warm day. It's two full-grown men and a 150. You know, we're still legal because you're in a 150 that what has a 1,600-pound rating, and uh, so you got about a 500-pound play with. But on a very, very hot day, yeah. that weight is coming down with the the density altitude, and you're like, oh no. So there's no way with the two of you on board in July, with flaps 40. There's no way that plane's going to climb or even hold altitude. It won't even hold. Won't hold. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, I remember in training I had an instructor 
that uh, he wanted me to train with 40 degrees to maintain in uh, full throttle up at altitude on much cooler days. He's like, I don't even think this thing is going to maintain. So we quit training at 40 and was training at 30 to do our slow flight because the flaps are just so much in that aircraft. You can't hold. Okay. We call them the barn door flaps. They really do. Everybody, even people I have never met, says, oh, your barn doors got stuck. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so this is something throughout the community of Cessna guys. There's two sayings, the barn doors, and the other thing is when one door closes, another opens, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Because everybody on a 150, maybe even a 172 on takeoff has had a door go pop. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and you go, don't don't worry about it. We'll get it in a minute. You know? Yeah. Okay, so you've taken us to, you are now, uh, you can't make that closed runway. Um, then what happens? So there's a road and a cornfield and then another field over there that's even further over to the left. We've avoided all the houses and at that point I'm letting Dan continue it as I'm continuing because we fought it almost all the way to the ground of me trying to, to fix the problem. Because uh, I'll be honest, at 10 feet, if, if I could have fixed it, I'd have said, let's go. You know, but uh, we took her all the way into the corn. I wanted the road really bad. And I've got to wonder, if I'd have tried for the road, would I have made it? Right. Um, but I, I had this problem with afterwards, I what if a lot of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? That's, that's normal. Dan is very experienced in aircraft, as we know, so I don't think any of this was much of a shock to him. For right. me, my head was spinning. And, and I felt like that I was clouded for at least two, three days afterwards. You know? Oh, yeah. I will. Absolutely. So it, walk me through the, the actual landing. So as we're approaching the corn at this point, Dan tells me, we're going to be in the corn. We're going to take it straight and level into the corn. At that point, the stall horn's on, but he's maintaining a glide. And at that point, I realized there's no point fighting the flaps anymore. We're getting really close to the corn. I started shutting. I shut all the electrical system down. I shut fuel off. And it broke my heart. But here we go. We're going for the corn. So real soft glide, you can start to hear the corn hitting the top of the, or the wheel pants, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, this may not be so bad. And about the time that you glide in and it just sounds terrible, it sounds like a million tin cans going through, you know, a ball pin or something, <laughs> right. and uh, all of a sudden it goes upside down. And uh, luckily enough, I had shoulder harnesses in this aircraft. And you're so wearing. you're held into place and you're slowly watching the world come over the top of you. And uh, it comes to rest right there, and Dan goes, get out, get out, get out, get out. And I'm still because thinking, there's a, fire, yeah. I, there's a part of me still in disbelief. We just landed in the corn, you know? And uh, he pokes his head. He's already out of the aircraft. And I remember him getting down and poking his head, and he said, are you getting out? Or are you okay? I said, I'm okay. Give me a second. He said, get out. <laughs> so That's a good call. Yeah. So, like I said, it probably took me 30, 45 seconds to get out because I was kind of in shock of, this really happened, you right. know? So I climb out, and he immediately picks up his cell phone, and he's shooting a video in front of it. <laughs> and in the video, he's asking, oh, which none of us has ever seen that. I don't know if he'll ever release it. He looks back, and he said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I told you. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Trust me, I'm good. And we can hear voices within just a, a probably what seemed like a very short period of time. I don't know. Some of it's kind of fuzzy. I guess there was people out running across that had seen yeah. all of it and were checking for us. But we're in corn when when you're five foot four, <laughs> five foot five, whatever I am, and the corn's six foot tall. You've got this little short path that your airplane that's your has world. created, <laughs> and that's your world. Your upside down airplane, and Dan over here, you know, saying we just landed in the corn. Oh wow. man. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now, um, what happened to the plane? So at that point, not knowing what to do, and all my flight training, nobody ever taught me what to do after you crash a plane. <laughs> you know, my phone was dead. I wasn't sure what to do. I had several volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, some pretty amazing people came up to lend a hand. And maybe they didn't even know what to do. So my thought is, I got to get it out of the cornfield. So I'm asking people, can you help me get it out of the corn? Some guy in a video that you'll see on there that's uh, a pretty famous video of he ran clear up to me there and, and the rest of the crew to check to see if there was any medical needs. Um, you hear in the video, they said, oh, the Air Force has been contacted. I'm thinking, Air Force. my God, what just happened? You know, <laughs> what are we doing? And then it isn't too much longer after that. The FAA calls one of the sheriffs there. I think it was a sheriff. It was some sort of law enforcement. Okay. 
So you, you got to kind of figure out what to do, and there's no real training for that. When I learned to fly, nobody taught me what to do after an accident, you know. So uh, there were several volunteers that came out that were willing to help, lots of wonderful people. You'll see some crazy stuff and some famous videos of there. There was people shouting that the Air Force had been contacted. Okay. I, you can imagine with me kind of being in shock and hearing stuff like that. Yeah, in the videos, they were asking, you know, how's everybody? And everybody's pretty vocal, including Dan. Not me. I'm the guy there that is like, what? Show shock. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so at that point, some volunteers are like, hey, we know some people with a crane. We can do that. And I'm like, okay, yeah. So it didn't take too long in law enforcement there that was on site. The FAA had contacted them. I mean, it happened fast. <laughs> and uh, the guy tells me, he said, that ain't your airplane no more. That's our airplane. Don't move it. Get your personals out and step away from the aircraft. So that even made the shock wow. even kind of worse because I wasn't prepared That's my for baby. That. Yeah. yeah. I really felt that way. I mean, yeah. that plane was a lot to me. You know, in a world of bonanzas and cirrus and everything, this was what I could afford, you know. You take that, you're the kid that really fixed up a Ford Escort, you know. Yeah, you oh, I get it. You took a lot of pride in that, you, love, you know. You love yeah, that Escort. Is, and they're saying, this ain't your plane no more. This is our plane. Get your personals and step away from wow. the aircraft. Don't touch it. So there's a guy calling me with, a, with basically a crane truck on the way, and he's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, I don't know anymore. I don't know what to do. Wow. Did so, anybody so, did anybody offer like you uh, like emotional support and no, stuff like that? No, 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 heavens no. I mean, I'm kind of no, like no, no. I, I can imagine no, you're they, walking uh, around like a zombie. So at they this brought point. an ambulance out and they put us both in the ambulance. And uh, um, my phone had been dead from recording events earlier in the day, so I don't even have a recording of me at Dan at no point in time because mine was dead. And uh, so when all the, the fire department gets there, they want to cut the battery out of the plane. And I have to beg them not to cut the plane up. I said, a half-inch wrench will take it right. I'll show you how to do it. And they're like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. And uh, luckily enough, there was a couple firefighters that were very heartfelt that said, we won't cut your plane up then. And uh, so they remove the battery. They escort me and Dan into the back of an ambulance, and they're checking us all out and everything. And I realize I have to call my wife. It's sitting <laughs> back at the hotel wondering why I haven't showed up yet. And I have to tell her, I've just crashed our little Cessna. Oh, man. You know? They let me plug my phone into the fire truck. They had all kinds of phone chargers in that thing. They were in here, I'm sitting in the air-conditioned truck waiting for this silly thing to turn on, trying to gather my emotions to make that phone call. That's got to be one of the hardest things you ever mm. do, you know? What was her response? What? <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're serious? So they've got a bus that runs back and forth between hotels. So at that point, she's got to find her way back on the bus to come find me in a cornfield, you know. And uh, there was tons of volunteers that came out to help. I don't think they even really knew what to do. Uh, you know, maybe this should be part of our training somewhere along the way of what your expectations should be and how to emotionally handle that. Because when you see your little baby flipped upside down, you know, your head just kind of explodes and you don't know what to do from that point. And Dan's like, uh, the band's about to start. Are you okay? Because I got to go. You know? <laughs> and he, wasn't, wow. he was serious. He had his instruments. He was ready to go play, which he became the celebrity then at that point because that wow. was the center of attention of, hey, you guys just were in the corn, you know. And uh, at me, at that point, the event was over. You know, oh, my well, heart yeah. was broken. I was emotionally distraught. You've lost a child. Uh, almost, yeah. Yeah, it's very similar, I would think, in, in that moment in itself. So what happened afterward? So, you so, so let's go into me with having my own YouTube. I've always had a YouTube, but it was just family. I had very few subscribers because it was family and friends that got to see what I did on the weekend with my little... Ford Escort, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but um, some people suggested that um, there could be some help. You know, maybe some people could donate some money to help you. And I'm like, that's all right. You know, and uh, no, we really think you should, is what the message was. And uh, one of the volunteers that was that day that was in the video, he suggested. He said, I think you should do it. And he stayed with me most of the evening. You know. Because at that point, I couldn't eat or drink. I was just so upset. And he kind of, there was a group of them that kind of stuck around me there before I went back to the hotel. So there you go. There's your emotional support. It kind of was. Yeah. But I think even for them, this was a group of pilots, too. Amazingly enough, two of them were truck drivers. 
So oh. we found common ground. But uh, uh, one of the guys pushed me, and he said, I think you should allow them to help you. You know, if, if he said, you just crashed at a YouTube event. Surely somebody made a dollar off of it. If they wanted to donate that dollar to you to see your plane go airborne again, why wouldn't you let that happen? So eventually you, you did. So I did. So some other people contacted me. There was a young lady from Arkansas that contacted me, and she said, I've helped a few other people do this. I know how it works. It's pretty easy. And she said, if you're uncomfortable with it, if you don't want the money, or you think that it may be attached to some bad karma or something, don't take the money out of the account, and they will give everybody their money back. So at this point, I get to go home. I get to see Don which, um, you know, he was pretty upset too. I mean, he's been flying for oh, quite a right. while. He wasn't really exposed to being in a lot of accidents or around that sort of thing. So I think he was a little shell-shocked in the beginning. He seemed upset with me, so it kind of put a strain on our relationship. Mm -hmm. And he starts thinking about how much it's gonna cost, because I said, we can't let this go. I didn't have whole insurance. Oh, no. So uh, he said, you know, we're probably going to spend $20,000 fixing this little plane that doesn't have the value of $20,000, which now the price, as you right guys have known, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. for some probably reason. Probably like $90,000. <laughs> no, I mean, yes. Exaggeration, but yes, I mean, it yeah. seems like it's, it's really exploded. And uh, so I'm thinking, well, we could do this, but it'll take some time, you know. And I said to some people, I've offered to help if we're willing to take it. And I said, I don't know that we should. And he said, he said, if you want to, I'm okay with it. But he said, it'll take a while. And there's a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us. And all he's seen at this point is pictures. And uh, so I said, yes, I'll do it, you know, which where it brings the YouTube in. So if you gave me money to help me rebuild my little Ford Escort of an airplane, I want you to see that that's what your money went to. So in the process of that, I've kind of realized that Don is one of those, um, how do you describe him? He's a guy that a lot of people know him that were around him in aviation because he's been in it so long. You know, mm -hmm. he's, if you ask him what engine is on a certain aircraft, he can identify it. He's probably told you when he's worked on it, what it was like. So I wanted to kind of introduce not just me and the airplane into it, but him into it. So in my YouTube, you start to get to see him, what his personality is like. And he's not always the bright and cheery. Sometimes he's sour, you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, but he's your typical 78-year-old man that has grown up in aviation, which wasn't me. I didn't grow up in aviation. You know, I had to be brought into it as an adult, and that's why probably my confidence wasn't as high. So you get two different perspectives there, you know, as we put this airplane back together. Okay, so to date, how much money has come in to help you um, get your little Ford Escort back up? So there was around $16,000. That's incredible. Which wow. I thought would have been way more than enough. But as we're repairing it, it's trickling down and down and down right. and down. And I think there's around $3,800 or something left. How much more work is left until the airplane is fully so, rebuilt? Um, so the fuselage has been basically all repaired. Awesome. And uh, firewalls back in it all the belly pans that need some paint work on the belly pans, but all that's ready. The seats are ready to go back in, doors, the rudders back on it. Um, the wings are removed off of it. One ring, wing was never damaged. Okay. One wing has two dents in it, and it's in the leading edge. So we won't know till we pull those off to what the damage is possibly behind it, but we're hoping it's minimal. Just a couple right. skins, maybe. Apparently corn's pretty, pretty impactful, you know, to some of that thin aluminum. <laughs> and uh, and then we'll have to do all the engine stuff. So we haven't really done anything with the engine. I guess Amazingly, it burned up for me. There was never a prop strike. I was about to say, is it? What, I guess you cut the fuel and everything else. So did you cut the engine before hitting the corn? No, but it, apparently it must have ran out of fuel. But that's huge. Because when the airplane was flipped upright, the propeller looks perfect. It's got one of those tiny little skull cap spinners sitting up on the front of it, right? It's still polished and no dents or scratches in it. I'm like, wow. How did that happen? You know, how did we flip upside down and never touch it? Wow. How did the nose cone not get smushed in? So, but it took the uh, nose wheel off, and as it took the nose wheel off, it tore up some belly pans, it wrinkled the firewall. Um, and then, of course, the lower cowling was completely destroyed, mm. you know. It didn't dent the tail or the rudder, 
which is amazing, but I guess that that really landing in the corn is kind of a saving grace, even though it seems violent, but it slows you down as you come into it, and it, it absorbs that motion. It's all about energy and so management. As, yeah, as that thing was coming over, I guess it just kept getting slower and slower. So when the tail come down and rested in the soft dirt that you know was plowed dirt in that field, it didn't damage it at all. Now, there's dirt everywhere, in my videos, you can see Don griping about how much dirt is everywhere in this airplane. You know, he's always saying, I'm, all I'm doing is cleaning dirt, you know. All right, so if, if people want to, um, to help and donate. I closed the thing. So I don't, they can't. So they can't. I closed okay. it. I took some, uh, I wouldn't call it grief. I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. I took some, some kind of grief over a few things. There were people that seen how quickly it did grow because it grew to $16,000 like that. Mm -hmm. It happened really fast. And then some people said, you know, I've lost loved ones to cancer and this and that. We didn't get that much help. And you're just a rich guy with your toy. Of course, they probably don't understand that I've got the almost minimalist of what you can have in a certified aircraft. Right. You know, hmm. and I thought, uh, I'm taking a little bit of backlash from it there. And I don't know that I have the time, being that I still work full time. And I'm building an airplane now to try to explain all this. And, and who knows, maybe people don't, don't listen. And if you've gone through something like that where you've lost a loved one and had a GoFundMe and it didn't work very well for you, I can understand the pain. Wow. So I closed it. The money should be enough to finish it. If not, I'll finish it on my own. Our plans is to have it ready by spring to take to some events because I think when I do fly it in at some different people events, people are going to want to see it. Oh, I think absolutely. people are going to want to see. Yeah. If you donated five bucks, and you may have seen that your money went there through a YouTube, but you're going to want to see that aircraft to see the work that was done on it, and to see you know what it looks like now. All right, the progress for people to see the progress on your little Ford Escort, where do they go? To Matt Mansell, my name. Okay, Matt Mansell on, at YouTube. Mm -hmm. So the okay. last name is M-A-N-S-E-L-L. -L. So and we'll have a name. link right there, and also I'll put a link in the mm -hmm. description. You know, I wish you all the best. I can't wait till you get into the air. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll keep checking out the channel and, and checking out your progress. So, Matt, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you again so much. Yeah. All right, so guys... Uh, go and check out Matt's videos, um, as I said in the link before. And, uh, you know, like and subscribe to Matt. And we appreciate all of you guys. The aviation community is an amazing community. And uh, Matt's story is a story of how we can come together as a, as a extended family. And I really, really appreciate you guys. So we'll see you guys next time. In the hangar.